Okay, so first question, how does AISC classify connections? Well, they use a, they use a table. They use a, not a table, they use a, a graph to do it. Who remembers the y-axis is, is on the graph? Fixed. Uh, fixed is right, and fixed is here. That's, that's right, that's right. But end moment is what's on the um, y-axis, that's right. And fixed is also right here. And what's the label for the x-axis? Rotation, end rotation. And we said if well if fix is up there, well then usually pin is pin some kind of pin connections down there. And then you realize those go forever, you know, in those two directions. Now how do we you know, there's there's obviously a lot of line in between here, a lot of a lot of space in between here, and and up into this point we've always just assumed something's fixed or something's pinned. Um, what's in between? Spring, rotational spring, a partial restrained connection. And for that, we actually have these lines that go out here, one that goes out here, one that goes out here. And the slope of this line was what? 20 E I over L. Now, I of what? The member. L of what? The member. Make sure your units are right. And then we have 2EI over L. And again, this was the um, simple connections. This was the fully restrained connections. And what do we call the ones in the middle? Partially restrained. Okay, so what this, this allows you to do is if you wanted to, you could take into account some partial restraint. Now, how do we find where our connections fall on this chart? How do we know? What do we do? That's right. No, that's 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 exactly right. We we are going to plot an in rotation versus a moment. Um, but for some of these connections, it looks something like this. We would say in rotation. What in? Ro I mean, what 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 in rotation? Well, it's going to be whatever it wants to be. Moment end moment. What end moment? Right? There's not going to have an end moment. Well, but is there? Yeah. If if we're going to assume something is a partially restrained connection, and that means it has to have some kind of end moment. It has to. Remember, we're we're it's almost like a guess and check type thing. We're assuming it falls into this category or this category, and then we're going to check it, okay? Assuming it's going to not be down here, and it won't be, it won't be. It will not be perfectly like this. There will be some restraint provided. So then we have to see if we have enough. Is there enough restraint? So how do you find out where the connection fell on this chart? Well, you assume that it, that it can transfer a moment. You would place the load on it, that you're expected. Notice in the example problem we were doing yesterday, we, we actually had a load here. Because for a low load, it may be plenty good. And for a high load, it may not be, right? And we care about where yield is, right? We care about the limit. Why do we care about that? Why do we pick yield as the place to investigate what's going on? Would you have to pick yield? No. You wouldn't have to. So why do we pick yield? That's right. That's yield is this magical place where if I'm going on, I'm going along, I'm going along, where something changes, right? when things are going to change. So we're really all interested in this point where things really start to change. And remember that that I we, we like to envision this and think of this as being a linear line, a bilinear line like this, but it's not really. It, it may look something like that. It's a curve of some sort. But we don't have time. We don't have that much interest to find all the points, unless we're really rich, right, or have lots of time. 
for a graduate student, right, do it with a research assignment, right? The only time you do something like that, we're interested in finding some key data points. And so that's why we choose that one. But also, it makes it easier to solve for it, okay? It makes it a lot easier to solve for it. Now, so how do we do that? How do we take this load, find this point, this, this point, what are the steps? I know we didn't finish last time, but we definitely started the start of the pro process, started it moving. What do we do? Yep, we assume first of all that this connection can handle moment, right? And then you said something about a moment at the top, and I'll say it a little differently. Um, I'm going to say we envisioned a load path. We envisioned a load path. And I'm giving you a very generic way to solve, not this problem, but all of these problems coming up. It's going to be a whole bunch of these hard type problems coming up. So we envisioned a load path. And we knew that there had to be a load path here, and there had to be a load path here. Right? For the moment. Has to be. Okay. Now why didn't we draw this line coming up here? Why, why didn't we draw why didn't we draw a line like this and a line like this? Why not? Why did I draw it just in those zones? I think you're saying the right answer, but I'm having a hard time here yet. We're only considered with we're considered with moments, and if we drew the stress diagram for the moment, we'd find the stress diagram looks something like this, and something like this, and it's down here. So this wasn't random that I drew those lines. I mean, I drew those lines for a reason and in a place and with a purpose because that's where the stresses are going to be the highest, right? You're like, yeah, I kind of got that, right? Okay, so I'm not asking you anything, I promise you. I'm not asking you anything that you don't already know how to do. We're really just putting it together in a different way, okay? And it's probably one of the first times in your career where you're going to have to truly put it all together, okay? We're doing it together on this problem, but there's going to be a whole host of problems and test problems where you have to put it together yourself. Okay? So the process is what's important. So we understood where the stresses were. We understood, therefore, where the resultants were. So we understood where the forces need to, needed to enter and leave, right? Now what do we do? What's next? So we got forces going through there. Okay, awesome. What's next? Yeah, no, yes, yes, yes. Everything you're saying there is exactly right. And I want you to take a little bit of a step back, but what you're saying is right on the right path. And what I want you to say, what I'm hoping you'd say is, is we are going to really look at each one of these load paths. And we're going to think about what needs to happen for them to be successful. Okay? So let's talk about the load path in compression. We didn't talk much about that. Probably because we're not that we're not that concerned about it. Okay, when things are in compression, they're usually really strong, and the only problems they usually have is when they buckle. Okay, and if we think about this system buckling, it, it's it's the only place it could buckle would be in that plate right there. Everything else is pretty thick, isn't it? You okay with that? So I'm really not worried about that. I mean, it doesn't keep me up at night. I'm not concerned. So you could say, hey, I'm not worried about that. But now let's go on to the other load path. And this goes back to exactly what, what, what Jennifer said. She was right on the right path. And she was talking about, you know what, what we did was, is we took, um, we, we basically looked at this load path. And we said, well, what has to happen? This is going to be intention, right? All intention. And I'm not worried about this web necessarily intention. I'm not necessarily worried about this flange intention. The bolts or the welds, I know how to check that intention, right? We know how to do that. But now I'm more concerned about this area right here in tension. And that's when I started to draw these diagrams. 
Because if tension is going to go through this area, then in a sense, if we think about magically taking our magic scissors and clipping out that top, that top clip, and I'm not sure how deep it is, but that's another argument. But imagine taking our scissors, clipping out that top part, that, that material up there, if we look in plain view, here's the column, there's one member, there's the other angle, our connection is here, whether it's bolts or it's welds, we talked about how to handle that, right? But what we have to con be concerned about is that load going through there. And what's going to happen if we clip this out, magically clip this out, we put that load there, well, this is going to be in a sense rigid, just like Jennifer said, and actually we assume like about all of that's about rigid, pretty rigid, at least rigid compared to the other parts of the member. Okay. Well, what's going to have to happen? Well, this is going to have to move, isn't it? It's going to have to move. It has to be able to move it because we have to find some kind of rotation. And if that's going to move, then this angle will no longer be touching. You with me? Hmm. <coughs> you with me? Kind of? The deflected shape is going to look something like that. Or that, depending on what the connections are. That's why if we have bolts, we assume they were fixed. And it's simplified to this. If we have welds, we assume they were pin, and it's simplified to that. Now, do you really think these connections are going to be fixed or pinned? Probably going to be somewhere in the middle, isn't it? But we made a simplifying assumption that, you know what? It's going to be close to fixed, so we're going to call it fixed. It's going to be close to pin, so we're going to call it pin. So it's about the process. It's about understanding the load paths and then checking those load paths. That's what we're doing. Okay? I know we're solving this problem about whether we're rotational stiff or not. Let's forget about the problem at the initial problem at hand and let's understand the question, the method at a larger scale. What are the load paths? Where are the load paths? What has to happen for those load paths to be true? Let's check those load paths and make sure they're okay, and then we'll know if our system is okay or not. Does that make sense, what I just said? Okay, so you're gonna get to do that a lot in this class, all right? Okay, so we happen to be applying it to this problem. And just like Jennifer said, we had the deflection, we came up with something like that, came up with something like that. Now, why, why do we care about this? Why do we care about how much it deflects? Deflection leads to a rotation. In that's thing. right. Deflection is going to end up leading to a rotation, and that's going to fill in right here, isn't it? This deflection at the top is going to end up causing some kind of rotation to occur. And you remember. All right. Great. Great, great, great. Good answers. So we had the rotation at the top, and this. now we started to get into the muck. And it's important to understand the direction you're going before you dive into the muck. Okay, because you'll get swimming in a direction and you realize, dude, I'm going south and I should have been going north. So you need to always understand the direction we're headed. Okay? Now we're going to just apply that. We took the same system. We're going to find, assume, we're going to try to find this, this rotation. We're going to put this force on it. We're going to solve for this critical point right here. We're trying to figure out where it is. And it's going to occur, this critical point is going to occur, this point where we're going to go from lots of stiffness into no stiffness is when we start to get some yielding of those angles. Okay? Yielding of the angles. Yielding either here or here, or yielding here and here. That's where the moments are highest, right? Some kind of yielding. Okay, great. So now let's solve for when that yielding is going to occur. 
Okay, well that's not that hard. I'm going to assume a deflected shape. I'm going to assume some kind of, that I'm at my limit, I'm at my rotational limit, so I've formed a rotational hinge here, right? And I'm going to find the points where the angle will yield or form a plastic hinge. And what's a plastic hinge? If you've had me before, you've heard that term. Plastic hinge is when you're, what's plastic mean? Well, it means no stiffness, right? Well, it means, hinge means no stiffness. Plastic means uh, yielding, right? So it's when your system has gone from stiff to not stiff because of loading. Okay, so we're going to find this moment. We're going to find the moment, and this moment we're calculating here is the, we're basically find, going to try to deconvolute and find the force. That force should be going in the opposite direction. That force that causes this to occur. Okay. So we're going to solve for what that moment is. And we're going to basically take the rotational stiffness of the, um, of, of the angle. And we have the depth of the angle divided by 2. We have our Fy, and we solve for a moment. And what I'm really solving for is this is the moment in the angle that is needed to cause yielding of the angle. The moment here and the moment here. The moment in the angle, the bending in the angle. And one of the things that's really hard to decide here is how deep is that angle into the page? Well, we could say, well, the whole depth is something like 16 inches. But remember, when we're deflecting, the whole depth is not rotating, is it? The bottom, we're assuming, is not rotating one bit. We could say the area just north of the neutral axis really isn't rotating very much probably not near yield. And really, this zone in here is, when R, or is where all of this rotation occurs, all of this movement occurs. And I'm going to assume some depth, some depth that it's plastified over. And I ask the question, well, what depth? What depth do you choose? And these are where you, you know, they, you have to make hard decisions. And we said about 5 to 10 percent of the total depth, maybe. You okay with that? About an inch is what I chose. Maybe, maybe an inch, inch and a half. If you don't know, work the problems multiple ways. Work it multiple ways. Assume multiple numbers and then make pick one or, ba or bracket it. Say, ah, it's between here and here. Okay? So, uh, great, we come up with a moment. 2.28 kip inches. So now, since I know the moment that it's going to take here, I know the moment it's going to take here to cause it to fail, I back calculate into what load it's going to take to make that happen. Okay, So that's just PL over 4. I solve for P. That's my moment from up here. My L, that's going to be my G, which is 2 times my angle depth plus the thickness of the web minus the K. Okay, so all I'm doing here, this is all a bunch of weird, complicated math, and it's real easy if you look for yourself. I'm solving this. I'm just solving for what G is. Solving for this true clear spacing. Okay? It's not that hard. And I get a value of 2.08 kips. So at 2 kips, at 2 kips of load placed at the top, I'm going to cause 1 inch of the angle to yield. Okay? 1 inch. Maybe I want to do it again for 2 inches. Maybe I want to do it again for three inches and kind of get a feel for what I'm saying, you know? And then go back and think about which one do I believe in the most? Which one do I trust? Okay? Which one do I think's right? But I'm going to stick with the 2.08 kip kips for explanatory purposes. And the angles are going to yield when I have 2.8 kips on the top and 2.08 kips on the bottom. My moment arm, assuming again this, was a, this is a one inch and one inch of yielding. Okay, a moment arm is 15 inches. That means when I have an external moment of 171.6 kip inches, 
I've yielded my angles. Does that make sense? I have just solved for that 171.6 kip inches is now the moment that corresponds to that point. What do I need next? Am I done? What do I need? The angle, the end rotation, right? Okay, great. So now I went ahead and did a little intermediate check here. I said, hey, I'm putting 150 kips on this. 150 kips was the load that we initially said that this, this connection needed to hold. 150 kips. And my moment arm, remember, was from here to here. Right? I said, you know what? I'm already at a moment of 450 kip inches. So I'm way past yield. Right? But we're, we're going to keep going. We're going to keep going. This is uh, um, for illustration purposes. Because I might not be. But we're way past yielding, but let's keep going though. So now let's find the rotation. So we're going to take that load, 2.08 kips, we're going to place it on our mythical structure, and we're going to use basically delta equals PG3 over 4080i. That's just a version of uh, PL cubed over 4080i, it's just the deflection for that. Um, plug in here for all my values. My G was on the previous page, 48E, I, and I'm using the I of the angle. I of the angle real important. I of that one inch deep angle. And I find out that this occurs at a deflection of 0 0.006 inches. Not very much. That means that's saying that the angle that that system is going to rotate 0 0.00, that deflection is going to be 0 0.006 inches at the top and then it's going to yield. And then it's just going to start going crazy after that. It's going to start deflecting a bunch after that. Okay, so we know this value is 0 0.006. We know that this is half the height, right? 16 over 2. So I can solve for that angle there. And I find out it's 7.7 .7 times 10 to the minus 4th radians. So now I have my, my moment. If I go down this value. I have my moment, 170 kip inches. I have my radian value, 7.7. .7. Now I just have to solve for what these line values are. So I'll plug in 2EI over L. So I'll do that here. 2, there's E, 29,000. It's always the same for steel. I, 4470, that's the I for the W shape. L is the beam length. You better put it in inches. And I get 14.4 times 10 to the fifth kip inches. That's the slope. 14.4 times 10 to the, to the fifth kip inches per, I think it's per radian. Is that, no, is that right? 14.4 m over theta is equal to the, the connection. Oh, okay. And I chose, I got 171. Okay, I know what I'm doing here. I'm actually finding the slope. I found this point. I'm going to find the slope of this line. If I do that, I'm going to take my moment divided by my theta. My moment, which is 171.6, divided by 7.7 .7 times 10 to the minus fourth. And I get 2.2 .2 times 10 to the fifth kip inches. And now I can compare these directly, my stiffnesses. So my connection is providing 2.2 .2 times 10 to the fifth. And I need 14.4 times 10 to the fifth to actually get it to be considered partially restrained. Does that make sense? So what was the answer? Well, it's a simple connection. You're like, I could have told you that in the beginning. And do not lose track that the reason we did this was to understand the method and understand the process of solving a hard problem. Okay? Does that make sense? So let's just say 
that I would have worked the problem and it, I would have had it come somewhere up here. And there's my yield. It goes this way. Let's say that, that that would have happened. And I ask you, can that be, can you use that as a partially restrained connection? And what's your answer? Only if you what? That's right. Exactly right. Only if you bound it. Only if you limit the moments that it's that it's effective over. Okay? If you pick something like, and I don't know if I'd pick that value exactly. I'd probably pick a little bit lower than that value. So between zero and this value, yeah. If you want to make it a partially restrained connection, it is. It's greater than that, it's a pin. Okay? Is there any questions about the process that we talked about? This concept and idea about partially restrained versus fully restrained. And if you remember, you go back to what I thought of, I didn't teach you anything wrong in the past, okay? We almost always would look at these things and say, I don't want to do any of these calculations. Now we know how to do the calculations, but what's even more valuable is we understand this process of taking apart a hard problem. And we're doing a lot of that coming up. Okay? Okay, onward we go, new set of notes. Okay, so the majority, the large majority of structural connections are assumed to be pinned. And this is often done, I mean, when there's almost any, I mean, if, if, um, if it's a fixed connection, we're going to provide load transfer at the top and the bottom in the web. If we don't have load transfer at the top and the bottom, then we're not going to assume often a fixed connection, some kind of partially restrained connection, unless we needed it, or unless we were doing a forensic study on what actual load it would take for something to fail. But this is really done because it's easier to just assume a pin and challenging to ensure a connection um, is constructed with the needed fixity. Notice also in all, those, in all those connection stuff that we just did, we assume that there was no slop in any of the bolts, that there was no movement, that there was no shifting, there was none of that stuff. Well, that's going to happen. It's going to happen. Well, how do you take into account for it? Uh, you really can't. Okay. If, if you're going to really rely on that, then you have you should probably... A, um, specify a slip critical connection, right? One that's post tension, right? The bolt's post tension to, to, so the friction's not overcome. That's why no one ever does it. A connection is um, constructed, um, you know, it's tough to ensure the connection's constructed with, with the need to fix it. Any slip, any local bearing or yielding can have a big impact on the stiffness of the connection. And there are two main types of simple connection types sandwich connections. In, uh, which are shown up here, and seated connections, which are shown on the next page. Okay, now sandwich connections, both of these connections, the reason why they're so widely used, or you could use a combination of sandwich slash seated. Okay, that's also common. Um, th they're used that way because they're easy and they're simple to build, and they're they're um, they're they're cheap. Um, these connections can give you some moment resistance if the beams are deep. The connection is long, it covers most of the depth, and the angle legs are thick, and we get very little bolt slippage. So if all of those things are true, we get some rotational stiffness, but just do yourself a favor and don't ever assume it, all right? Unless you have to. And even then, I'd look for a different solution. Seated connections. In these connections, um, the bottom angle, this bottom material is designed to take all of the load and the top angle acts as a brace. Now you oftentimes will not see this top angle used very often in a connection, in a simple connection. Oftentimes they'll just have the bottom. Okay? And that is fine 
and we'll talk about why that could or couldn't be done. But that is fine if your beam is short. But if your beam is tall, that's bad. It has to do with bracing. We assume when we do beam design that at the connections they're brace points. And we're also going to learn bracing. What a bracing really means is, is it prevents twist. All of that will make more sense coming up. It's all about preventing twist. And if you brace it at the top and the bottom, then you will prevent twist. If you only have it at the bottom, you do not prevent twist. That makes sense to everybody. Okay. Oftentimes we put things like walkways or other beams or other things up here, which indirectly will act as a brace. Okay. Sometimes we get away with that. But if you have a very deep beam, then you should put the connection at the top to prevent twist. All right? All right, more on that coming up. So we're going to talk about CD connections for a second because we know how to design these. We know. We already had a homework problem on how to design these. We know all about how, 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 how to design these. No problems. These are a little different, though. What's the load transfer in something like this? Well, we're, first of all, we're just going to assume it's, it's there's just shear, right? There's no moment. It's a simple connection, right? So how is the load going to get out? What's it going to have to do? It's got to go through the bottom. Well, truly, it's going to start about the middle. It's going to come down here. What's it going to do now? Go through the bolt. Actually, could you build this without a bolt there? Yeah. Could. Or a weld. You could. Don't have to have one. I think it's a really good idea to have one. Okay. But you wouldn't have to. Okay. Because it's gravity, right? It's 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 in compression. So it goes through, it hits this, and what's it gonna do? It's going to transfer through here. And what's it going to cause when it makes this turn? And what's going to cause bending to curve, right? That little length right there is going to act as a beam. Has to. Remember how I talked about envisioning the load path, thinking about what has to happen, and checking every piece of the load path to make sure it has the capacity to be satisfactory. So it's going to act as a beam, and it's going to be in bending in and shear. It's going to come down here, and then what it's, what's it going to do? It's going to go through the bolts or through the welds, right? It's going to go through the bolts or through the welds, and then it's going to go into this member. So now let's take a let's make a list amongst ourselves. Might not get everything. We'll get the majority of it. What all the bad things that can happen? Okay, that's never good, right? I, I'm a positive person. I like to think of all the good things that are going to happen, but we're going to make sure no bad things happen. So let's make a list together of bad things that could happen. Who's got one? You better just take a seat. Just think. Which welds are going to fail? We got welds right here. Right? Bolts slash welds. That's possible failure, right? What else? Fracture the angle. Okay, where's that going to happen? Well, I think you're talking about somewhere in here. Is that what you're thinking about? Okay, so we've got, why don't we just call, uh, we call it fracture, but we could call, why don't we call it angle failure? You okay with that? That could be from bending, that could be from shear, either one. What else could happen? What else could go wrong? Both great answers so far. How about some stuff we haven't talked about in this class so far? How about this idea that all of this load is being transferred right here, locally? And that is it possible that you could get some local failure in the web? I mean, what's the deal with the web? You want to make it sh it's skinny, right? Isn't it possible? possible that that web could be so skinny 
that over here it was spread out, the load was spread out, so it was plenty strong. But when you concentrate it and concentrate it and concentrate it right down here, that it's going to get high enough where it's going to cause an issue. Yeah. It's called the local web failure. And we'll talk about that. That's going to be either a web crippling or yielding type issue. Now, how about, is there an, another place we could cause an issue? Exactly right. Exactly right. We could have issues right here, couldn't we? It's possible. We could have local, again, local web failure. So now, we looked at this problem, we started out, and again, we envisioned the load path, and then we made a mental list of everything that could go wrong. And now we'd go back and check it for each part of the load path. We'd go back and check it and see if it's, if it's, if it's satisfactory or not. Does that make sense? Okay? So is anything going to be any different over here? Well, the load's going to be the same. Now, there's not going to be any bending, is there? Because this is a deep, stiffened member. Now, the other thing is that um, this kind of spreads out where the load goes a little bit. So it's probably less likely we'll have an issue down there. Probably less likely. And this also helps spread a little bit where the load goes. Um, and so it's, like, it's less likely we'll have an issue up there. We'll talk about that coming up. But still something that needs to be checked. Now we don't have the bending or the shear, but now we could have some kind of buckling of the stiffener. That makes sense. Great. Great. So we've talked about all of these possible failure modes, and we're going to zoom in on a couple here. We're going to talk about this local web crippling or yielding, and that's just this localized failure right here. And actually, um, as David brought up, the exact same thing could be happen here. And all we're going to have to do is just need to modify our equations a little bit. Okay? But again, before you jump in and start swimming, you need to know which direction you're headed, right? So we're headed to handle all of these. Okay? Now guess what? We already know how to do this. It's just a beam. It's just a short beam. Okay? We're gonna learn how to do this. We're gonna learn how to do this. We already know how to do this, don't we? We already know how to do that. It's done. We've been talking about that. It's class. And we're going to learn how to do this. But then once we're done, we're going to be know how to do the system. The full system. And again, the way you figure out the capacity or the situation in your system is you envision your load. How is my load going to get to the ground? Got to find a load path. And you're going to check every single part of that load path where a failure could occur. And this is where you have to do it on your own. You're going to have to figure it out on your own. Okay? Okay? Great. Now we've got this local web crippling or yielding, is what we're going to call it. And then we've also got this failure of the seat in bending or in shear. Right? Two things that we need to add. So when designing an unstiffened bearing seat, it's typical, it's typically assumed that some bending of the seat occurs at a high load. That means is that when if I, if I put a high load on this, it's assumed that not all of my bearing seat is in contact. Imagine, it, they're basically assuming that there's some bending that occurs in that bearing seat. So some of it's going to not be, there's air here, air, and we know air is not very strong. Right? 
and then we have this area that there is no air. More strength. Okay. We're going to call this the area of the seat, or N. And I'll be honest with you, it's a little challenging to know where N is, how big N is. What people usually do is that if this is the length of your angle, they usually assume that one quarter of your angle is not in contact, and three, to three quarters of your angle is possibly in contact. You, of course, you'd have to subtract out whatever your space is between your beam and your, and your column. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So these force, this force is some yielding of the angle, but reduces the design moment. To stop local yielding of the web, we look um, at a section just above the chamfer over a length of the bearing area, plus 2K. What? We can all imagine that a lot of loads being transferred right here, right? If there was no flange there, it would be real easy to say, okay, this web's bearing here. That's all there is, right? We have a flange down there. And because we have a flange down there, it's going to allow some of that load to escape out. So we're actually going to be able to account for not just N, but we're going to be able to go this 2.5 times K more. What's K? K is this edge of your chamfer to the edge of the beam. K is a term that you got to ignore a whole lot in previous classes that now you need to know what, the, what it is. So you get to go 2.5 K. Well, how do they come up with that? Well, they did lots of experimental tests. And they found out you could go with around 2.5 K. You know, if you didn't know this, you wouldn't have the experimental test, then, then maybe something like K would be a good number. Right? 45 degree angle. People like to assume 45 degree angle. And this is even way more than a 45 degree angle. And why is that? Well, it's because we get some stiffness. We get some stiffness out of this bottom flange. We get some benefit out of this bottom flange. So it's able to get more load transfer out. Great. This helps us size our bearing area N, or this 2.5 K. And if we had this equation, this would be basically something like um, this would be a length, this is a thickness, so between these two we get an area, right? We multiply it by a stress and a phi factor, we're going to be able to get a load. You with me? That's all that is. And the cool thing is we get to use a phi factor of 1 for these calculations, which is kind of wild. But that's what they allow you to use. Now, this is what the true equation is, and if you really want to use this equation, you can. What people commonly do is they use a simplified version of it that's in your manual, and instead, this simplifies into something like a phi r1 plus an n times phi r2. I, I give you the values, R, what phi r1 is and what phi r2 is. The cool thing is you never have to calculate any of this, because it's all in your steel manual. That's pretty cool, and I'll show you where. Phi R1s and Phi R2s are in the manual on pay table 94, page 940. We'll look at that real quick. I don't have to carry this bad boy back. Here next time I teach. Nine forty beam bearing constants. So for the different beams. They've got, they've got phi R1, phi R2, phi R3, phi R4, phi R5, phi R6, all of these phi's. This is the shear capacity of the beam. Just look up the beam and all these things are in. We're going to be using all of these coming up, all right? Okay. But we're going to remember that if E is less than D, we'll use this equation. And if E is greater than D, we get to multiply this front one by 2. Why would that be true? So 
Well, what's E? Well, E is this distance from the center of your loading to the edge. And it's comparing it to D, and D is the depth of the beam. So they're saying if E is less than D, which I would say 95% of the time it always is, you're going to use that equation. But in weird situations, when E happens to be greater than D, you get to use 2 times phi R1, 2 times this. Why? Well, this equation, this amount, this stuff, takes into account that angle, that extra material. And if we are way away from the edge, way away from the edge, and we draw what our failure is going to look like, we're going to have our plate, our angle at the bottom, we're going to have our beam, we're going to have our end value, we're going to have two and a half on one side, and we're at what? Yes, we're going to have two and a half on the other side, aren't we? We're going to have two of these two and a halves. Two of these, which happens to be the same thing as two of those. Does that make sense? We were constrained. Our load path only allowed us to take into account n plus one of these when it's near the edge. But when it's not near the edge, we get n, we get one two and a half k, we get another two and a half k. Load's going to be able to spread out. Yes, sir? Anytime you have an interior support. Uh, it didn't have to be an angle, it could be a beam going in the opposite direction. Could be all kinds of different thingamajiggers. Good point. I appreciate you saying that. I've been told that I've disconnected from the internet right now. 